Hey, good morning, Lake Tomahawk Bible Church. How are we this morning? We're good. I'm glad to see you here. Glad to see some visitors here. We are going to sing the Lord's praises this morning. And what a beautiful morning it is. So if you would join me in grabbing your red hymnal, we're going to sing Crown Him with Many Crowns, hymn 62. And while you're doing that, I'll open us up in prayer. Stand if you're able. Father God, we thank you for the beautiful day that you've made. We thank you that you are Redeemer, our great Savior. We thank you that you're our friend. We're, thank you, we're thankful that you sent Jesus Christ, your Son, as the atoning sacrifice for our sin, that while we were sinful, you still loved us, and you still love us today. We thank you for that. We are here to worship you in spirit and in truth, and we desire to give you glory today. May the praises of your people be appreciated by you and be a blessing to your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's sing. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side. Rich wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his wondering eye at mystery so bright. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father known, one with the Spirit through him given from yonder glorious throne. To Thee be endless praise, for Thou for us has died. Be Thou, O Lord, through endless days, adorned and magnified. Be Thou, O Lord, through endless days, adorned and magnified. If you would turn to your insert, there's a song called Good, Good Father. We're going to sing that now. I couldn't find my third verse, so I've got the insert there. Thanks, Tim. A song that talks about our good father, God the Father. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me 
that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide but i know we're all searching for answers only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. For you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so undeniable I can hardly speak Peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love, 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 love. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Father God, we thank you that you are a good father, that you love your kids, you love your creation. We thank you for the work you've done on our behalf to bring you into fellowship with yourself through the work of your son. We love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to Lake Tomahawk Bible Church. I see some visitors in the crowd today. That's great to see. Welcome. Um, thanks for being here today. Um, for those that are new here, my name is Tim Sauter. I'm one of the elders for Lake Tomahawk Bible Church. Um, we've been meeting here in the Sloan Center since uh, about the middle of January. Um, we're in the middle of a building project, so that's all, all fun stuff. So um, thanks for being here. Um, let's see. So going right into our... Um, bulletin. Uh, we got our Bible studies here. Uh, if you're interested in a Bible study, getting connected, that's listed in there. Um, and I heard a rumor that there may be a new group getting started up, maybe, in the near future. Maybe. We'll talk about mo when we have more information. There, there, is, um, there is something going on, so there may be another group getting added here. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, coming up, we got Snowshoe Baseball tomorrow night. Um, so if you're interested, if you don't have one already, if you're interested in helping out, uh, we do have some um, limited sizes of Lake Tom polo shirts in the back. Those are $16 a piece. Uh, so if you're going to, it's not required, but if you'd like to wear one when you come help out at Snowshoe Baseball, that'd be great. Um, so tomorrow's, it is a new date. Uh, we were going to do it in August, but now we're doing it tomorrow. So um, we do need help. We need pies. Um, so if we can take all the pies we can get at this point. Um, we need uh, people that can run the grill. We need people that can serve. We need someone behind the counter that can bellow all the orders and make sure we're not missing stuff. We need money takers. Um, so we got a lot of, a lot of positions. So, uh, man, did I cover everything? Okay. Um, if you're going to make pie, I know there's some people in the room that are going to know a lot better than I do, but the big sellers are normally the basics, 
the, the, the tried and true. I mean, I'm looking to, for help. Uh, pumpkin, apple, chocolate cream, fruit pies, pecan. pecan. If, if someone wants to, hey, that's my, one of my favorite pies. If someone wants to tackle pecan pies, uh, more power to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so if, you, if you're interested, if you need help, or if you, if, you, if you want to help and you have questions, talk to myself or Amanda, and um, we can get you guys squared away. We have to be there at what time? Anytime after 3.30 or 4. Anytime after 3.30 or 4 to start getting set up. And I, in the past, we've grilled brats and burgers beforehand, and they put, go in the Nesco. So if, if, anytime you can get there... It's going to be good, so um, that's that. Um, Stephen Forrester has been here in the past. He's going to be here next Sunday. Um, he's an evangelist. He travels kind of the, the region. Um, in the past, he's done puppet shows. Um, it's kind of, I don't, but he's never done the whole service. He's only done part of a, part of a message. So this year, he's going to do, he's going to lead worship. He's going to give a message, and I'm sure... We're not 100% sure, but it sounds like there will be a kid's puppet message, too. But we're not really sure. we got to try and nail that down and get some more information from him. But Stephen Forrester will be here next week. Um, David Haug's uh, memorial service is in two Sundays on June, uh, July 30th. Two Saturdays, thank you. Uh, July 30th, that will be here at 10 o'clock uh, for visitation and a short service at 11. Um, we got an elder meeting on Wednesday, and there's also a missions committee meeting on Wednesday at noon here. Mary? Oh, the missions committee meeting has been canceled, so that is not happening. Okay. Um, that's all I've got for my announcements. Uh, yes, uh, Greg? Thanks, Greg. Six o'clock at Camp America, at Camp American Legion on County Highway D, on Wednesday nights, for vets. Every, only vets? No. Whole community. Okay. <laughs> but primary tailored towards vets. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other announcements? Oh, the quarterly meeting business packet is on the back table for after service. Thanks, Ange. Well, I guess we have one. Yes, Mary. Um, I just wanted to announce that. Sure. Uh, we no longer sponsor Lemuel right now, but uh, they do have a huge project going on uh, as far as um, digging water holes. And um, they have a backhoe right now, and um, the man is willing to stay an extra week to help dig this um, water holes for them. And this is the biggest project they've ever done. So they're trying to raise about $4,500. Uh, if you were to give money, uh, it would be done on a personal basis. And there are three different ways that you could contribute to their fund. Um, you would either do it on um, 
a Gmail account, or um, you can write to Pennsylvania, and I have the address for you, or you can do it through their extreme response, and um, that would be through their website. So I just thought, if you weren't aware, um, they have a big water project going on, and, and in the past, we did well, dri well digging for them, so, and that didn't work out as well as we had hoped. So it's exciting what's going on there, and we're not supporting them, but I thought maybe some people were still strong in their hearts wanting to see water for them. Thank you. I'm talking about Lemuel. Where are they digging the wells? They're not digging wells. They're digging um, these big water holes um, in Haiti. Oh, <laughs> I, I was. I guess I was thinking people understood where Lemuel is. So it's it's in Haiti, and um, the water when they dig it in um, it wells, it's not good water. So they have to rely on the water that comes down from the mountains, and they collect it in water holes. And that's used for drinking. It's used for watering their gardens. It is used um, for uh, animals. And um, they said that food ha has doubled. It keeps doubling for them. Um, from year to year, prices keep skyrocketing. So they have to really raise their own food. They can't, they can't keep buying anymore. It's, it's too much. So they have to rely on their gardens. Good morning. Uh, update on the building. Uh, this past week, uh, Jack and I walked through uh, looked at what framing we've got left to do. Um, we are down to two rooms. That's all we've got left framing-wise in the building. Uh, so Jack and Ron pulled off this week and did some outside work. Uh, if you've driven past, you've seen uh, they've done some work out on the end of the driveway trying to fix some erosion problems we're having out there. Um, they also did some, some smoothing out of the driveway and then also went through and try to dig up rocks and clean up the, the yard as much as possible so that we can get some grass growing uh, without destroying lawnmowers. Um, <laughs> uh, next weekend, next Saturday, we're going to have a work day. Um, and I've been toying around with the idea of what all we're going to do. Um, we're going to focus on the wiring um, inside, um, but we're also, Jack's dug up a bunch of rocks outside. Um, so if there are some kids that want to come out and collect rocks, um, I said collect rocks, not throw rocks. I don't want to see little catapults built outside. Uh, but there's some, some work outside that needs to be done, so if there's any kids that want to come out and do that, uh, it's open for them to do that. Um, also, ladies, we are going to open this up uh, if there are any ladies who are interested in helping with the wiring. Um, feel free to come out and help us out. Um, any questions on that, uh, let me know. Um, the work is still progressing. Um, we're getting reports of interactions with people in the community. Uh, I know Paul had someone that lives near him that donated 100 bucks towards the building. Um, doesn't come here, isn't part of the church, but heard about the project and wanted to give something towards it. Um, so that there are people that are paying attention, there are people who are open to talking about it, and we need to use that as an avenue for talking about God with them. Um, so this is good news, it's great. Um, come out next weekend, uh, come out at lunchtime if you want to look around. Uh, we had a lot of visitors yesterday that showed up, get a walk around. Um, come out, see what's going on. Thank you. If you'll provide it. All right, so if you are going to be at the work day on Saturday, let us know. Diane's going to be providing um, the hospitality committee, and Diane will be um, providing some lunch. Um, Diane, did you have something else? 
I'll get to you next. Okay. All church picnic. Thank you, Jeannie. All right, so for those that couldn't hear all the way or are listening online, um, All Church Picnic, August 7th. It is a potluck. The hospitality committee will be providing meat and drinks, but everyone else, we should still be bringing a uh, dish chair, uh, and that will be at the park uh, right next to the Sloan Center. So August 7th, and sign-ups will be out in the back next week. So uh, with that, I will bring up Kate. And we'll do, why don't we have the kids all come forward and sit in the front row and uh, do a little children's message. Thanks. Kids, you're not singing today, so you don't need to feel shy. <laughs> Steve is telling me I need to use this microphone. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> That's where I was. <laughs> All right. Um, NK, do you want to come help the verse with me? So today, the kids, um, good morning, kids. It's nice to see you. I, I'm still missing mine. Mine aren't coming. And any other kids who'd like to come, come on ahead. We're just going to spend a little time with you guys this morning. Thank you all. Oh, there I am. Boy. <laughs> um, thank you all, kids, for coming today. It's nice to see you. And who would like to raise their hand and tell me if they remember why we're doing this during the church services? You don't know, Seamus? Do any of you kids remember why we're doing this? How about you, William? William. Thank you. Can you do you remember why we're doing this? No, you don't remember? That's okay. That's why I wanted to talk about it again. This is only the second time we've done this. And we have some guests today, so I just want to let you guys know why we're doing it too. Um, Kay and I do Sunday school with the children. And during the summer, we have so many people on vacation, camping, things like that, that our usual Sunday school curriculum where we build week upon week, walking through the Bible and understanding God's plan throughout all of history, wouldn't work so well when we're missing about a quarter of our kids every week. But kids... Hi, good morning. Kids, you guys are so important to our church, right? You're part of our church, you serve our church, and all of our church wants to serve you guys. And so we're bringing you up so we've got just a moment to spend time with you. So this week, Mr. Simmermaker is going to take a quick minute to talk to you before his sermon. And he's going to talk with you about what he's talking about today. But before we do that, all of the congregation together, our theme verse for what we're doing here is Psalm 145, 3 and 4. So kids, can you look at the verse? And can everyone stand? Thank you. And let's all say our verse together. Psalm 145, 3 and 4. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Okay, and that is one of the most important things we can give to each other. Um, how many of you kids, raise your hand if you know your grandma or your grandpa. Raise your hand if they get to be part of their, your life. That's so special. You know what, I got to grow up knowing two of my grandpas and one of my grandma, and I didn't know my other grandma. And so what I don't know 
myself is how much she loved God. But my aunts and my uncles and my mom and my dad, who all knew my grandma, they tell me about how much she loved God. And they tell me about how she trusted God when she got very sick with a disease called cancer. And she still had my Aunt Eva in her tummy. And the doctors told her, I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to have this baby because of your sickness with cancer. And she trusted God, and she said, God will take care of everything. And sure enough, her, my Aunt Eva grew in her tummy very well, and she was born, and she was very healthy. So I never knew my grandma, because she's in heaven now before I was born. But I know from my aunts and my uncles and my mom and my dad and my grandpa how much she loved God and how God took care of her. And that is what this verse is saying. One generation shall declare your works to another, or shall praise your works to another. And that's what my family did for me. And now some of you here in Sunday school today, your grandma is here. I know two families for sure that your grandma is here with you, praising God with you together in the church. But not everyone has their grandma or their grandpa or their aunt and uncle in our church building to help us worship God. But you know what? If you turn around, can all of you kids turn around and look at all the grown-ups in the church? Every single grown-up here wants to help you love God more, and they want to praise God with you. And so that's why we're doing what we're doing today. And so praise the Lord for the relationship that you guys have with each other. We want to thank all of you adults for your impact on the kids, and we thank you kids for your willingness to serve the adults. And one day, we will get that ice cream sundae plan back so you guys can serve ice cream sundaes to the adults, right? Maybe we'll do it at the all-church picnic. We'll have to decide how we can do that with the heat, or we might have to wait till September. <laughs> Anyways, here comes, pardon? Okay. Here comes Mr. Simmermaker to talk to you guys. I'm so glad I got to be involved with the Children's Minute this week because my kids know I'm a big kid too. Yeah, as I shoot them all the time with Nerf guns at home. Hi. You're allowed to talk. This is when you're allowed to say hi back. Hi. Hi. All right, so last week, if you guys were here, remember we started talking about the Book of Judges, right? Okay, so we're going to keep talking about the Book of Judges today. And today, we're going to talk about a guy that you guys probably know, right? We're going to talk about Samson. You all know about Samson? Uh-huh. Does anybody not know about Samson? Okay. Just imagine Superman in the Bible. Okay, that was Samson. Okay. And we remember him being big and strong, right? Right? No? You don't? Oh, come on. All right, does anyone know what his name meant? It meant sunshine. So Mr. Sunshine was a big, strong guy in the Bible. But what you might not know is that Mr. Sunshine, God had a plan for Mr. Sunshine from before he was even born. God had a plan for Mr. Sunshine when he was a little kid. Okay. God came to Mr. Sunshine's parents and said, you're going to have a son, and he's going to have a special job to do. And what did his parents say to God? No, they believed him, but they, his dad asked God a very important question, and he wanted to know, how do I raise this child? How do I raise this child the right way? And that tells me that Mr. Sunshine's parents tried their best to raise their son the right way. And you all are here in church because you're... Because your parents feel the same way. God has a plan for all of you as well. And your parents love you just like Samson's parents loved him and tried to raise him right. 
And what we're going to see is we're going to see that Samson decides not to, not to listen to God and throws it all away. And you all will have the same choice as well. Okay, so when we're, when we're listening to me come up and talk later, okay, think about Mr. Sunshine. Think about how you too are like Mr. Sunshine in your own ways. And listen to the story about what he chose to do. And remember that. Okay? Okay? Can you all smile at me? Because we're talking about a guy named Mr. Sunshine. <laughs> all right. You can all go back to your seats now. If you would grab your insert, uh, Lift High the Name of Jesus is the song we're going to sing next. And it is in your insert and the stand if you're able, and we will sing this together. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus our King. Make known the power of His grace, the beauty of His peace. Remember how His mercy reached, and we cried out to Him. He lifted us to solid ground to freedom from our sin. Oh, sing, my soul, and tell of all He's done till the earth and heavens are filled with His glory. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus our Lord. His power in us is greater than, is greater than this world. To share the reason for our hope, to serve with love and grace. That all who see Him shine through us might bring the Father praise. Oh, sing, my soul, and tell of all He's done, till the earth and heavens are filled with His glory. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus our light. No other name on earth can save, can raise our soul to life. He opens up our eyes to see the harvest He has grown. We labor in His fields of grace as He leads sinners home. Oh, sing, my soul, and tell of all He's done till the earth and heavens are filled with His glory. Oh, sing, my soul, and tell of all He's done till the earth and heavens are filled with His glory. Flip over to Give Me Jesus in your insert. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. 
Just give me Jesus. And when I am alone, and when I am alone, oh, when I am alone, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. When I come to die, oh, and when I come to die, oh, and when I come to die, Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. You may be seated. All right. Before we go to the Lord in prayer, I just... Uh, seeing if anyone has any prayer requests for today or um yep diane say say the game Okay. Thank you, Dan. Mary? Okay. And when is that, Mary? Wednesday. Okay. Uh, over here? Someone over here? No? Okay. Steve? Will? Okay. Arlen? Huh? Hattie? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you for this day. It's a beautiful day to be alive here on your creation, this earth. Uh, I just, uh, you know, these, these days in northern Wisconsin and in July and August that are just 
bluebird days, great days to be outside, great days to just be alive and uh, revel in your creation. It's uh, just uh, every day that I wake up here in the North Woods and realize where where my family and I get to to live and um, just witness your creation firsthand is uh, it's a huge blessing, and we just th- am thankful for that. I just uh, would lift up um, Melinda and Chips, um, who are pregnant with their first child and um, daughter. Their daughter is pregnant with their first child and um, second child. I'm, <laughs> but anyway, Lord, we just uh, lift them up. Uh, you know their needs. We just pray for um, your healing hand, your your guidance, your um, comfort as they go through this challenging time uh, that's supposed to be beautiful and lovely, lovely and fun. And uh, it's just uh, unfortunate that uh, they're dealing with this. And we just pray for your guidance in that family. Pray for um, Jim Lafreniere as he goes in for... Um, heart surgery on Wednesday, and just lift him up, guide, um, pray that you would uh, guide the hands of the surgeons, um, that uh, the procedure would be um, successfully completed. Um, pray, lift up <clears throat> Steve's friend, um, who had a bunch of his intestines um, removed due to a cancer, um, and just uh, pray that you would... Uh, Soften his heart if he's not a believer um, to hear your word and to believe and trust in you. And uh, if he is a believer, just pray for his his comfort. Let's comfort either way, truly, honestly, Lord. But uh, pray for his salvation if he's unsaved, but uh, pray for comfort if he is saved and if he does know you. Just pray for, lift up Maggie, uh, who lost her husband recently. Um, Just... uh, let her know that uh, she's loved and that she has uh, a Lord and Savior in your, in your son. And I just uh, lift up Maggie. Pray for Kate today is uh, just that uh, she'd feel better, that uh, her, what ails her would be um, softened and, and that uh, she could uh, move about her days in a, in a comfortable position. And Lord, I just lift up... Um, Hattie, I just uh, remember her today as uh, Arlen uh, brought up, and I just uh, pray that she'd be with you today, and that uh, you'd be have her hand, your hand on her. Lord, I just uh, pray for Steve as uh, he comes, prepares to come up here and, and preach your word, and I just pray that. Uh, Hearts would be softened to hear the message and um, and uh, just be with Steve today. Lord, I pray all these things in your name. Amen. I should put on rollerblades as many times as I come back and forth between that sound booth. My dad was a math and science teacher in Christian high schools when I was a kid. And he was known for his antics, sometimes one of which, uh, since he was Canadian, he would uh, put on rollerblades and he'd rollerblade around the school during the day to all of his classes. Um, So yeah, if you wonder where I get my antics from, it's genetic. It's not my fault. Good morning again. It's good to see everybody here. It's always good when we have to start pulling out chairs uh, because we don't have enough. So that's good. Um, Okay. Hundred kids are a lot. 
I have three, and that's a lot. So yes, uh, we will remember them. A hundred kids is an amazing opportunity. Um, I gotta stop talking about kids. Uh, <laughs> last week um, we started looking at the book of Judges, um, and we looked at how the book of Judges isn't really about the various judges mentioned in it. Um, the book is about the relationship between God and His people. And the judges were a response from God to the Israelites turning away from him. Last week we started with the judge Othniel and went through the judge Gideon, uh, who's one of the more well-known of the judges, um, though Gideon is also the first judge that we see that falls into sin. And, and we're going to finish our survey of judges today, and we're going to start in Judges chapter 9. Uh, and the last half of the book um, can be broken up into essentially four main stories. Chapter 9 is the story of Gideon's son, Abimelech. Um, chapters 10 through 12 are the story of the judge Jephthah. Chapters 13 through 16 are the story, is the story of the judge Samson. And the remaining chapters, chapters 17 through 21, is the story of the near destruction of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, in chapter 8, a bit of a refresher from last week. In chapter 8, we find the Israelites asking Gideon to become their king, which he refuses. Um, Judges 8, verse 22. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's sons also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And chapter 8 concludes with the death of Gideon and the Israelites immediately turning away from God and returning to idolatry, which is a consistent response from the nation following the death of a judge. Um, but before his death, we have a short bit of info concerning Gideon's family. In Judges 8, verse 30, And Gideon had threescore and ten sons, which is seventy sons of his... It's a big family. Of his body begotten, for he had many wives. And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. And chapter 9 details the story of Abimelech, uh, but we see here at his introduction that he is separated from his brothers. His mother is noted as Gideon's concubine, not his wife. Uh, we would have had, he would not have had the same inheritance rights as his brothers. Uh, his mother was probably a Canaanite woman, so he would have been also separated from his brothers ethnically and socially. His name, noted here in verse 31, as whose name he, which is referring to Gideon, called Abimelech, means my father is king. So we see a decaying of Gideon spiritually, that while when he was younger he had refused to be made king, later in his life he seems to be claiming the role, if not officially. Following Gideon's death, we find Abimelech making moves to establish himself as king. He goes back to his mother's house in Shechem and builds support amongst his Canaanite family and the community there. He is like them. He is part Canaanite. After getting the support of the city of Shechem, Abimelech decides to dispatch any other claims to the throne by murdering all 70 of his brothers, which he does, except for one, Jotham. In Judges chapter 9, verse 5, And he, Abimelech, went unto his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubbabel. Jerubbabel is another name for Gideon. Uh, we see this in Judges 6:32. Uh, slew the sons of Jerubbabel, being threescore and ten person, upon one stone. Notwithstanding, yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left, for he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together in all the house of Milo, and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. This area where the coronation of Abimelech is held is a historically significant location for the nation of Israel. 
This is the spot where God promises the land of Canaan to Abraham in Genesis 12:6. This is where Jacob buries the idols that Rachel had stolen from her father in Genesis 35, uh, verse 1. This is the site of Joshua's last speech to the people in Joshua 24, verse 25. The reference here to a pillar is either the stone that was set up here by Joshua or the oak tree that is referenced in Joshua and Genesis. This place is significant to the Israelites. This place was chosen to place Abimelech's coronation as a peer to these other events. Following Abimelech's coronation, we find the first parable recorded in the Bible, a parable given by Jotham in which he calls out the Israelites for their betrayal of Gideon's family and curses Abimelech and the men of Shechem in Judges 9, verse 16. Abimelech would go on to reign for three years, in verse 22, before his reign devolves into infighting and civil war. Uh, We see that he would eventually burn Shechem to the ground because they revolt against him. He would then attack another city where he would die after receiving a head injury sustained when a woman drops a stone out of a tower he is attacking and it hits him on the head. In order to keep from being known as a man killed by a woman, Abimelech has his armor bearer kill him. See this in Judges 9, verse 54. Then he, Abimelech, called hastily unto the young man his armor bearer and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that the men say not of me, a woman slew me. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father, in slaying his seventy brethren. And all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham the son of Jerubbabel. Now some people consider Abimelech to be one of the judges in Israel, Um, But I disagree with that. I disagree with that because we don't see Abimelech being raised up by God. We don't see the Bible referring to Abimelech as a judge. We don't see the Spirit of God or the power of God coming upon Abimelech. Instead, I think Abimelech's story here is a continuation of Gideon's story. Gideon was a man that an angel of the Lord... Uh, which is pre-incarnate Christ, came to, that Christ appeared to, that personally called to be a judge of Israel, to be a leader of the Israelites. Gideon was a man who made specific requests of God and saw God's response and God's power. Gideon was a man who was powerfully used by God, and we would see a man who would eventually let that power go to his head. A man who would name himself king when he knew who Israel's king was. When he proclaimed to Israel who their king was, a man who would name himself king in the naming of his own son. We see the destruction and death brought on by, yes, it was because of the choices Abimelech made, but also by the far-reaching influence Gideon had even after his death. Abimelech grew up carrying the name, my father is king, which meant he was a prince, which meant on the death of his father, he would be king. Abimelech's story isn't the story of a judge. It's the story of the consequences of a judge falling into sin. Would Abimelech have had this notion, this assumption of royalty if his father had lived like, if his father hadn't lived like a king? If his father hadn't named himself king in the very naming of Abimelech, would any of this bloodshed had happened if Gideon had kept himself humble? If Gideon had maintained that God was king and that he was but a servant of God? Following Abimelech's death at the end of chapter 9, we find two judges, Tola and Jair, noted in the beginning of chapter 10. Um, Not much is known of these judges other than their lineage, where they lived, and how long they served as a judge. So also we don't know anything bad about them. So good job, you two. 
In verses 6 through 9 of chapter 10, we find the Israelites turning to idolatry again, and God gives them over to the Philistine and Ammonite nations for 18 years. In verse 10, the Israelites again call out to God for deliverance. Judges 10, verse 10, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians, and from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines? The Zidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Maonites did oppress you. And ye cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me, and served other gods. Wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in this time of tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them, and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel." This, this is the setting of the story of the next judge, Jephthah. We see that in this repeating cycle of sin, judgment, repentance, and deliverance, Israel has come to the repentance and deliverance portion of the cycle, but God says no. God is not raising up a deliverer for them this time. God is not delivering them from their punishment as soon as they cry out to Him this time as He has done every other time. And we see that it grieves God to leave His people in their punishment. It, it hurts Him to do that. It hurts Him to not immediately come to their rescue. Because this isn't what God wants for His people. At the end of chapter 10, we find the Ammonite armies have arrayed against Israel. And the Israelites have assembled their armies to fight, but do not know who to lead them. Because that role is something that God has always raised up a judge to do. Chapter 11 opens with the introduction to the man Jephthah. Judges 11, verse 1, Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead beget Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and who went out with him. We have here in the introduction to Jephthah a man with some similarities to Abimelech. We don't have a lot of information about Jephthah's father, Gilead, uh, but since they lived in a place named Gilead, it may be safe to assume Jephthah's father was somewhat well-connected. We, a, a, we also have Jephthah set apart from his brothers due to his mother, who the Bible calls a harlot, a, a prostitute, um, possibly a Canaanite. We don't know. Perhaps we see in his brother's response to him where they kick him out of the family home Perhaps we see his brothers remembering the story of Abimelech and what Abimelech did to his brothers. Whatever the actual family background and drama, we find Jephthah, the illegitimate son of a prostitute, forced out on his own by his own brothers. And we see him establish himself as a mighty warrior, a mighty man of valor in verse 1. And he assembles a somewhat rogue collection of men that fight alongside him. In verses 5 through 10, we find the elders of Gilead coming to Jephthah to ask him to lead their armies against the Ammonites. Why would the elders do this? Why, why, why wouldn't they do this? They had asked God for deliverance in the end of chapter 10, but God won't raise up a judge. What are they to do? They're facing annihilation at the hands of the Ammonite army. So they look around and they find a man a son of Gilead. Let's ignore who his mom is right now. Let's, let's forget about that. A man who has a reputation as a skilled warrior who already leads uh, somewhat of a militia of sorts. Verse 7, And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, 
Did ye not hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come unto me now that ye are in distress? Jephthah's, Jephthah's, Jephthah's words here parallel God's response to the Israelites in chapter 10 when they ask him for deliverance. Very much a, oh, now you need me. Now you need me to do something. Let's forget, I guess, how you treated me in the past, how you rejected me, now that you need something. But the elders continue to press him, even agreeing to his request to be made ruler of Gilead should he be successful in defeating the Ammonites. Jephthah returns home to Gilead in verse 11 and immediately sends communications to the king of Amnon, Ammon. He seeks a diplomatic resolution to the conflict. The, the, and the core of the dispute is the Ammonites consider the Israelites to be occupying land that doesn't belong to them and they want it back. Who hasn't heard that before? And we see this in his communications with the king of Ammon that Jephthah knows his Jewish history, at least concerning the conquest of the promised land. In verse 23 of chapter 11, So now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before his people of Israel, and shouldest thou possess it? Wilt not thou possess that which Chamosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, them will we possess. And now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel, or did he ever fight against them? While Israel dwelt in Heshbon in her towns, and in Aror and her towns, and in all the cities that be along by the coast of Arnon three hundred years, why therefore did ye not recover them within that time? Wherefore I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. The Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. Howbeit the king of the children of Ammon hearken not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent them. This is a very interesting message given to the king of Ammon by Jephthah. Who does he say took the land from its inhabitants and gave it to the Israelites? God. And he, and he, he kind of turns that statement and he throws it back at the king by telling them to possess the lands their God, Chamosh, has given them, to which they can't respond. And Jephthah also makes a statement, the Lord, the judge, be judged this day. Is there currently a judge in Israel? The Israelites would say no. They had asked, but God said no. But Jephthah here says God is their judge. God is their deliverer. God is their leader who would save them supernaturally from the Ammonites. Here we have a man a man cast out by his family, a man born of a prostitute. Here we have a man who stands against a king and says, God is our judge. God is our deliverer. And how does God respond? In Judges 11, verse 29, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah and Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. The, this phrase, or variations of this phrase, the Spirit of the Lord came upon, is an indication of God empowering an individual with his own power. This phrase is used in reference to the first judge, uh, Othniel, in Judges 3.10. It is also used in reference to Gideon in Judges 6.34, and as well with Samson in Judges 14.6, 14, 14.19, 14, and 15.14. The use of this phrase with Jephthah as well as the statement and Jephthah judged Israel six years in Judges 12.7 are evidence that Jephthah was indeed a judge of Israel. The Ammonites did not listen to Jephthah and Jephthah and his Israelite army destroys the Ammonites' army and 20 Ammonite cities in verse 33. Um, but, but prior to the battle, Jephthah makes a vow to God. He, he makes a deal with God. That if God will give him the victory, that he will sacrifice as a burnt offering the first thing that comes out of his house when he returns home after the battle. He is victorious. 
But when he returns home, the first thing that comes out of his house is his daughter. While there are some who say that Jephthah does not actually sacrifice his daughter, the text here seems pretty clear that Jephthah will kill and burn his daughter's body as a sacrifice to God according to the vow which he had vowed, noted in verse 39. And, and, and the, reason, the reason some say Jephthah does not actually sacrifice his daughter is because God has never required child sacrifice, because God hates child sacrifice. Child sacrifice is listed among the sins of the Canaanites in Deuteronomy as a reason for their judgment and utter destruction. God did tell Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, but God never intended Abraham to actually do it. It was meant as a test of Abraham's faith. God sends an angel to stop Abraham, to make sure that Abraham cannot sacrifice Isaac because God never wants child or any human sacrifice. Yet here with Jephthah, we find a child being sacrificed to God. Why? Why does this happen? How does this happen? How can a judge of Israel do this horribly wicked thing? Because as we saw with Gideon, a judge is just a man or woman with Deborah. A judge can fall into sin. A judge is not perfect. But unlike Gideon, we do not see a spiritual decaying in Jephthah. Jephthah is presented in, in, throughout his whole story as a near constant man. He doesn't seem to change at all throughout his story presented here in Judges. And I think this story of Jephthah and the sacrifice of his daughter is meant more to describe the spiritual decay of the nation of Israel as a whole. They didn't drive out the Canaanites completely. They didn't utterly destroy them as they had been told to. They've intermingled with them. Their societies, their cultures, their religions have intermixed. How many times have we seen them turn to idolatry? Idolatry that had included child sacrifice as an integral part uh, just in this book already. Here we have this man Jephthah, a man who knows the power of God, who knows that it was God who destroyed the Canaanites from before the Israelites. A man who has seen God supernaturally destroy the Ammonites from before himself. But we also see a man who thinks that child sacrifice is acceptable to God. Following the sacrifice of his daughter, Jephthah finds himself having to fight with the tribe of Ephraim, who felt insulted by Jephthah concerning the battle of Ammon. In Judges 12, verse 1, and the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passed thou over to fight passed us over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didn't call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon, and when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then aren't ye come unto me this day to fight against me? This fight, this battle, would lead to the death of 42,000 Ephraimites. Verse 6. And Jephthah's death uh, is recorded in Judges 12, verse 7. Uh, and after his death, three more judges are noted in the following verses. These three judges, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon, have about the same amount of information noted of them as we saw with the judges Tola and Jair in chapter 9. And the noting of these three judges closes out chapter 12. And chapter 13 begins with the cycle of sin starting yet again in Israel. Judges 13, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing, for lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. This is the beginning of the story of Samson, Mr. Sunshine, the final judge noted in the book of Judges, and one of the most well-known, if not the most well-known character in this book. And while the Israelites are in servitude for the Philistines for 40 years, noted in verse 1, unlike before, we don't see them cry out to God for a deliverer. Yet a judge is named. But instead of a man, he is named prior to ever being conceived. Also, instead of being told that Samson will deliver them, Christ says that he will begin to deliver Israel. Noted in verse 5. The beginning of Samson's story has similarities with the beginning of Gideon's story in that the angel of the Lord, uh, this is Christ before he came as, as a babe, appears to call the judge. His story also has similarities with the following and the final judge, Samuel, in that his mother is barren. Christ would appear two more times to Samson's mother and father as detailed in the remaining section of chapter 13. And we find Samson's birth recorded at the end of chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 24. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtal. We find Christ telling Samson's mother to avoid wine and to avoid touching unclean things while she is pregnant with Samson because Samson is to be a Nazarite. This is referring to the vow of the Nazarite as detailed in number 6. In number 6, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either a man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord he shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his head. All the days of his separation he is holy unto the Lord. Even before Samson is born, we have an interesting question concerning Samson. In verse 5, Christ tells Samson's mother, The child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. Yet in number six, the vow of the Nazarite is a voluntary thing. A person, a man or a woman, chooses to become a Nazarite. Chooses to separate themselves unto the Lord. Yet we do not see Samson being given that choice. Samson is, is honestly, he's a very strange character. He is a Nazarite, but not by choice. When I was studying the story of Samson, I struggled to understand what his story is. The commentaries I referenced were also similarly puzzled by Samson. 
His parents also seem to be confused by what Christ tells them concerning Samson. And we see his father Manoah actually ask God twice in verse 8 and verse 12 of chapter 13 how they are supposed to raise this boy. And, and I've said it before, when the Bible starts to repeat itself, you might want to pay attention. And this point stuck out to me. Here we have a father praying to God, asking for instruction on how to raise his child. He even asks this of Christ to Christ's face. This is noted specifically. And most of chapter 1 is the story of his parents interacting with pre-incarnate Christ. And this is important. This is a detail that God wants us to have. Why? And it's because I believe that this is to show that Samson's parents were intent on raising their son properly. On raising their son in a good home. On giving their son a good Christian upbringing. To put it into modern terms. We see in verses 24 and 25 that God blesses Samson as he is growing up and that his spirit comes upon him at multiple times as he grows into a young man. No other judge in this book is noted as having this Lord's spirit come upon him more than once. But here the Lord gives Samson his spirit multiple times as a child. You know what the story of Samson is? It's the story of a man blessed with giftings from God and raised in a godly home with attentive parents. It's the story of how this man never used his giftings for God, how he took these giftings for granted, how he threw them all away. As a young man, we, we see that he decides to marry a Philistine woman. And, and we see his parents question this decision in chapter 14, verse 3, but he insists Referencing back uh, to the section in Numbers about the Nazarite vow, there are three restrictions on Nazarites. Don't cut your hair. Don't touch grapes or wine. And don't touch dead things. That's their three restrictions. And in chapter 14, while traveling down to marry this Philistine woman, we see Samson entering a vineyard, presumably, presumably, to partake. And he breaks one of these restrictions but God gives grace. We don't see God punishing Samson. He doesn't take away Samson's gifting of strength. And we see that as Samson in the vineyard comes upon a lion and literally rips it apart with his bare hands. That's a pretty awesome feat. But we see in verse 6 that he doesn't tell his parents about the lion. Why? Why? Because he was in a vineyard when it happened. Because he knew he shouldn't be there. Because he knew what his parents would say. Because his parents had tried to raise him right. As he's going back and forth to visit with this Villacine woman, he comes upon the carcass of this lion and there's a honeybee's nest inside of it. So he reaches down and pulls the honeycomb out of the dead body and eats it, breaking the second of his Nazarite restrictions. But again, God gives grace. He doesn't take away Samson's gifting of strength. And we see through his whole life that Samson acts entirely based upon what he wants. What his desires are. He battles the Philistines only when it suits him. Typically only when they've insulted him or somehow wronged him. He displays amazing supernatural strength, but we never see him thank God or even acknowledge God after using this gift. He never rallies the troops. He never acts in unison with any Israelite, unlike any of the judges before them, because it doesn't suit him to do so. Eventually, it is the satisfying of his desires that leads him to losing his gift of strength. In Judges 16, verse 19, And she, this is Delilah, made him, Samson, sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks off his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. 
And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. That phrase, to shake myself, I just see him walking out there like, I'm just going to stretch out a little bit and blow away these guys. Because that was, that was his personality. That was what he, he's always had this. But with the cutting of his hair, with the breaking of the third and final of his Nazarite restrictions, God pulls back his gift of strength that Samson has had his entire life. And what do we see here? Samson doesn't even recognize the loss of it. He's so far removed from God that he doesn't even recognize that God is no longer with him. He goes out to fight the Philistines, and I can only imagine the shock he felt when his blows bounced off the soldiers. When the soldiers overwhelmed him, when he saw the excitement in the Philistines' eyes, when they recognized the confusion and the panic in his own eyes as they overwhelmed him. Samson, unlike every judge before him, had been separated unto God from before his birth, had been overwhelmingly blessed by God with supernatural gifts, but also unlike every judge before him, Samson would not be given an easy death. Samson would not go quietly to his grave. Unlike every judge before him, we find Samson is blinded by his enemies. He is enslaved. He is forced to do the work of an animal. As he worked at the grinding mill, pushing that big stone around and around and around, day after day after day, he realizes what he had. He realizes the error of his ways, and he restores his relationship with God. Verse 22, Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. God gives grace. God gives forgiveness. In spite of how far Samson had fallen, in spite of all the gifts and the good circumstances of his life and how he had thrown them all away, God gives grace. The Philistines take Samson to a huge feast at one of their temples in order to display the great Superman they've defeated. And we see in verse 28, Samson humbly praying to God. And this is only the second time uh, we find recorded where Samson even talks to God. The first time when he demands God give him a drink of water. Here we see a humble and a broken man asking God for strength, and God restores Samson's gift of strength, and he destroys the Philistine temple. Judges 16, verse 29. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal in the burying place of Manoah, his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. Here we have Samson's greatest victory over the Philistines. And it's when he is the weakest. It's when he is blind. He's probably malnourished. He's in chains. And I think this story points out what could have been if Samson had decided to serve God. I mentioned that the Nazarite vow was a voluntary vow, a choice that, that Samson had never been given, which is right. He was never given the choice to be a Nazarite, but he was given the choice not to be. Here at the end of his life, we see the power of God. We see the missed opportunity in Samson because he chose not to serve God. He chose not to use his gifts for God, even the supernatural gift clearly given by God. The last chapters of the book of Judges 
uh, chapters 17 through 21, detail a story of the abuse and murder of a Levite's concubine, the subsequent infighting between the tribes of Israel, and the near complete destruction of the tribe of Benjamin, all of which paint an overall picture of the state of the nation of Israel as, as essentially the same state as the Canaanite nations detailed in Deuteronomy that they were sent to destroy. Judges 18 verse 1, in those days there was no king in Israel. Judges 19 verse 1, and it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. And the last verse of the book, Judges 21 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The closing verse of this book sums up the state that Israel is now in. They have fully rejected God as their king. There, there, there is no king in Israel because his people have rejected him. These verses aren't in here to point out that Israel needs a king. They're, these verses aren't in here as some sort of setup for the book of 1 Samuel. They are in here to point out the total rejection of God as king of Israel. These verses are couched in horrible stories that paint a picture of the state of spiritual decay within the nation of Israel. Stories that parallel descriptions of Sodom and Gomorrah and the Canaanite nations listed in Deuteronomy. The book of Judges details the lives of the men and women God raised up as judges over the nation of Israel, but the book isn't about them. It's about God's relationship with his people. It's about his people turning away from him and what he will do in his attempts to bring them back. Four weeks ago, we started looking at the book of Joshua, which starts with the story of Rahab. And we talked about her faith, her faith in hiding the spies, her faith in recognizing God as God and believing on him. Hebrews 11, verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. Here in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews has laid out chapter 11 as something that we refer to as the Hall of Faith. Old Testament heroes of the faith, examples to us, uh, the people who would have this Bible, who would have this as the only thing we have, these are people we are to look at as examples of faith. Rahab is an easy example, but, but he closes out the hall with examples from the book of Judges. And who does he call out? Out of all the judges noted in the book, who does the author of Hebrews call out as examples of faith? The screw-ups. The imperfects. Gideon, a man who created an idol, a man who acted like a king, a man who lived like a king, a man who named himself king in the naming of his son Abimelech, who would then later go on to try to claim that title for himself as some sort of pseudo-birthright, causing death and destruction within Israel. Barak, a man too cowardly to fight, a man who may have been called as a judge and refused out of fear. Samson, a man gifted above all others, a man who had been given everything and couldn't be bothered to serve the God who had provided these gifts. And Jephthah, a man who committed child sacrifice. Why are these men listed in the hall of faith? Why are these men lifted up exam as examples to us of faith? It's because they are the screw-ups. It's because they are the imperfects. But these men each exhibited faith in God. At some point in each of these men's lives, they looked at what was facing them and said, I will have faith in God. And God used them. Gideon, a man untrained in war, took a ridiculously insignificant army and conquered an overwhelming army at God's instructions. A man who pointed a nation away from himself and back to God. 
Barak, a man who recognized God's calling of Deborah and followed her, a woman, into battle because his faith finally outweighed his cowardice. Samson, a man, though broken and blind, called upon God to restore his strength and collapsed a temple with his bare hands. And Jephthah, a man whose theology was wrong, but acted on his faith in God, on what he knew about God, to provide the victory against overwhelming forces. See, God isn't looking for perfect people. God is looking for willing people. Marcus, he told me one time, if you wait until you're perfect before you start serving God, you will never start serving God. The four men, these four men are listed in the Hall of Faith as examples of faith with all of their shortcomings, with all of their imperfections, with all of their struggles. And look at what God did with them. What can he do with you? What can he do with me? Let's pray. I mean, Father, Lord, we, we thank you for this book that you have given us, that you have, you have protected over the millennia so that we could have it, so that we could have so that we could have these stories of the screw-ups. So that we can know that you love us in spite of what we do, in spite of how we mess up, in spite of our own imperfections, in spite of of everything we don't know or we don't understand about you, Lord. You just want us willing to serve you. You just are looking for our faith. You are looking for our love for you. Lord, I thank you for the people here, the people who come out, the people who spend their Sunday mornings instead of relaxing at home, they, they get up, they get dressed, they come here because they want to know more about you. They want to worship you. Be with us today as we go out. When we mess up, when we screw up, Lord, let us not feel like you've abandoned us. Let us remember that it's us that's turned away from you and all we have to do is turn back around and you're still there. Thank you for what you've done for us. We love you. Amen. So Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever, and it's him that we worship. We're going to sing fairest Lord Jesus and end our service. So if you would look in your hymnal at hymn 50, we're going to sing fairest Lord Jesus. And if you stand, if you're able...
soul's glory, joy, and crown. Fair are the meadows, fairer still the woodlands, robed in the blooming garb of spring. Jesus is fairer. Jesus is purer. Who makes the woeful heart to sing? Fair is the sunshine. Fairer still the moonlight and all the twinkling starry host. Jesus shines brighter. Jesus shines purer than all the angels heaven can boast. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God, and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be Thine. Amen. There is a meeting after church this afternoon. If you